everyone and welcome. In this video, we're going to be talking about brake by wire. So what is brake by wire? Is it safe? And the vehicle we are going to be using to demonstrate brake by wire is this Audi e-tron Sportback. Uh, so this is Audi's all electric e-tron and this is the Sportback version. So it's got that swept roof line in the back. Uh, and so what is brake by wire? Well, essentially it just means that you have electronic control of your brakes. So when I touch the brake pedal, it's not actually, I mean, it is creating pressure. I do create pressure when I press on that brake pedal, but that pressure is not doing anything. What's doing something is an electric pump. So it's electronically controlled. So what's actually happening? Well, I press on the brake pedal and there is a position sensor for that brake pedal. And so when I am actually pressing on it, there is a resistance to that, but that resistance is artificial. So you have essentially a simulator that's simulating that feel for you. And so, you know, the, the engineers can design this brake pedal to feel however they wish. Uh, so they have complete control over that and there's a simulated feel to it. But what the system is doing is monitoring where is your foot on that brake pedal using a position sensor. And that position sensor goes to a brake control unit, which says, okay, here's how much pressure we should apply to the brakes. Here's how much deceleration we want. Now, this is quite common in electric cars and hybrid cars because you also use regen. So when I press on this brake pedal and my braking, my desired braking is less than 0.3 G's of deceleration, well, essentially what the system's going to do is just use the electric motors and just use regen. The mechanical brakes, the disc brakes aren't gonna be doing anything. It's just gonna be energy fed back to the batteries and using those electric motors to slow it down. When that position sensor goes past the point at which it says, okay, they want more than 0.3 G's of deceleration. They want to really stop. Um, 0.3 is actually quite a bit. I mean, it's a significant number. I think Nissan Leaf is doing 0.2 G and even that is a significant amount of braking uh, when you feel it, you know, just at 0.2 G. So 0.3 G is fairly significant here in the Audi. So once you go past that threshold, then there is an electric pump, which is going to create the pressure for those individual brakes. So you're taking out that direct control from the driver and the common concern here is, well, what if it fails? And so it's like, yeah, they've thought of that. There's no worries. And so you'll notice in the, the diagram of how this works, there actually is a path for that brake fluid from what is essentially your master cylinder to get to your individual brake pads. Normally that pressure is routed elsewhere, but there is a redundancy in the system that's monitoring whether or not it actually functions. And if for any reason this system were to fail, immediately a valve opens up and now your brake pressure from your pedal actually does go to the individual brake pads, the pistons applying pressure to those brake pads. So in that scenario, in that worst case, scenario where everything is to fail, you still can stop. Now, a lot of people look at this system and say that's not actually brake by wire. And I think, uh, well, first of all, it is brake by wire. I mean, it's what Audi calls it. It's what Corvette calls it in the C8. It's what all the companies are calling it because it is electronic control of the brakes. The computers have control ultimately. There are certainly varying brake by wire systems out there. And I think eventually it probably will be more common that you don't even have a hydraulic system involved and you can take out some of the complexity of these hydraulic brake systems that are doing, you know, both electronic brake by wire and have the full redundancy of the hydraulic system. But for now, that fail safe exists. Now, in pretty much all driving scenarios, always, it's never going to be used. It's only used if it fails. And so probably most owners will never, ever, ever know what their actual brakes feel like uh, because it's not going to fail. I mean, it's, it's a low risk item. And if it does, fail, hey, it still works, you still slow down. So why would you incorporate a system like this? Well, I think one of the main advantages comes from a safety standpoint in that the car has more control over the brakes uh, versus a traditional system. So in safety scenarios where it needs to control specific pressures uh, to those brakes, that control is all there electronically. I think also, you know, thinking about from a feel perspective, 
When you have a car that's switching between mechanical brakes and electric regen, then you can kind of have this weird transition period in your brake pedal. And so with this brake by wire system, the brake pedal is going to feel the exact same no matter what. So, you know, if it's just using regen or if it's using the mechanical brakes, you're just getting this artificial feedback, which to you, uh, you know, the oblivious consumer, it just feels like you're braking. It doesn't feel different than what you're already used to. Uh, so I think there's reasons why, you know, you don't want to make it feel weird and strange when you have that blend from using regen to switching over to the mechanical brakes. And then you can also eliminate some of the chatter, like if you're to stand on the brakes and get ABS, uh, you, you can improve the way that that feels to the driver so it doesn't feel strange or alarming. It's just stand on the brakes, you come to a halt. Very simple. So how about the Audi e-tron Sportback? This is my first time driving uh, any of the e-tron, so I'm excited to get to try out another mainstream electric vehicle. And I think the problem from my end is that I approach cars as an enthusiast, and I think that's a dangerous thing to do in this scenario. Uh, we'll get into kind of why, but you know, they're trying to make a car that feels normal. It doesn't feel like this giant leap, uh, this weird revolution when you get into this thing. It's gonna feel a lot similar to what you're already used to. So a few of the technical details, this has dual motors, there's a larger motor in the rear, and the rear motor is more efficient, so it's doing most of the work most of the time. If you don't need the power, it's mainly going to be using that rear motor for efficiency. Now, typically you have about 350 horsepower, 400 pound-feet of torque, and then you can put it into this boost mode, sport mode, and you get an additional, you know, 50 horsepower, and you're at about 400 horsepower and 490 pound-feet of torque. So with the boost mode, you know, you put your foot down, it certainly is quick. Zero to 60 in 5.5 seconds. So, you know, for the price range, yes, there are vehicles out there that are quicker. I think when you start comparing it to internal combustion alternatives, 5.5 is very quick and you do have that very quick immediate you know off the line acceleration so let's talk about this battery because this is where you get into the conversation of this is just made for the everyday driver not the enthusiast so it is a 95 kilowatt hour battery pack they've updated it since the previous year and so it's a larger battery pack and they give you 91 percent of that to use so you get to use 86.5 kilowatt hours there's no choice on the end of the consumer of hey where do i charge this thing to and i think that goes back to that enthusiast argument like i have Tesla and in that Tesla you can set hey what do you want to charge your battery to but that's something you have to think about in order to maintain the longevity of that battery without either saying look we don't want the customer to have to focus on that they don't need to think about it they just need to get in it and everything works and it's no different than what they're used to so it charges up to a hundred percent which is using you know 86.5 kilowatt hours there's a buffer left there so that the battery has a long you know duration it's gonna last a long time without degrading versus if you were to constantly be charging it up to 100%, which causes lithium ion batteries to lose their useful life. So there's many indications to me that this is designed in a way that it's not supposed to just feel like revolutionary. It's supposed to feel very normal, except it's electric. So you get the benefits of electric. It's quiet. Uh, you know, you have very quick response. You've got plenty of torque. Those advantages you get, which all make a ton of sense in a luxury vehicle. You know, you don't have gear shifts. Uh, so it's, it's seamless as far as the acceleration. Everything that you would want in a luxury vehicle, electric cars are very good at, and so that makes sense in this aspect, but you know, they don't have you thinking about, hey, what do I want to charge my battery to? They don't, you know, when you let off the accelerator pedal, you can choose if you want aggressive regen, but naturally it's just going to coast. It's going to feel just like you're driving something else. Um, another thing, when you start up the car, it says uh, to put it in gear, you know, turn the engine on. And it's like, you, you read that as like an EV enthusiast and you're like, ah, eh, I don't know, that seems a little weird. But if you think about it as just like, a normal person's gonna buy this car and drive it, they're gonna read that message, and you know, maybe it should just say, turn the car on if you wanna move. But they're certainly gonna know what, hey, turn the engine on to put it in gear means. Gear being, you know, drive, reverse, neutral, even though it's just one gear that you're using to drive. So the driving experience as a whole caters to just not having to do too much extra research about what is an EV, you know, and how does it work, and what do you need to do to drive it. Uh, it's very simplified in this strategy and like from my perspective as an enthusiast I want that control I want to be able to say okay this is what I want to do and you can change the regen settings here um, but like you can't go in and say oh I want all 95 kilowatt hours of the battery uh, for this brief moment 
Okay, so let's talk about range. Full charge, this claims EPA rating of 218 miles. When I plugged it in, charged it all the way up, uh, the readout said about 240 miles of range. And of course that depends on how you drive, but about 220 miles of range. Now, I think the important discussion is you know how much range do you get based on the size of the battery and the weight of the battery and this is actually a very large battery 95 kilowatt hour and a very heavy battery this car weighs about 5700 pounds so this is quite a bit of heft you are rolling around in and so for the size and the weight of the battery, I don't think the range alone is all that impressive. That said, I think there's this conversation that needs to be had about EVs that we don't need massive range in a lot of scenarios. And so I think the big advantage right now that Tesla has in the fact that they have you know, very high EPA ratings for range is that because EVs are new, people are scared about range. And in reality, you know, someone buying this, this is probably gonna be in a two car garage. Like it's gonna be sitting with another car. It's part of a family and they've got two vehicles. And for everything around town, you'll almost never ever need 200 miles. And yes, if you go on road trip it's, and it's your only car, then you have to use that charging network. There's an Electrify America network for vehicles like this in order to use. Uh, and that's when range actually starts to matter. But in the majority of cases where you're charging at home and you're just driving around town and you have multiple vehicles, EVs don't need really high ranges. And so for me, when I look at the range of this, 220 miles, 218 miles, that's plenty. I think the unfortunate news is the size of the battery and that's what you get. Um, there are cars that can certainly go further on the same amount of energy. So that's the disappointment, not that the range isn't that high. I don't think, you know, looking at 200 mile EVs, you gotta be thinking, oh, that's not enough range for me. Um, just base it on your scenario. If, if it's gonna be your only car and you have to take long road trips, yeah, then it's something you have to think about. If there's multiple cars at your household, and this is the one for everything around town, then you know it's an easy decision. It makes so much sense and 200 miles is more than enough and there's plenty of lower range EVs that make sense in that scenario. And so that's where you can start to pull out price uh, when you can start to have lower range, smaller battery pack, lower priced EVs and it feels like the market is kind of a bit scared of that right now because EVs are new. We don't wanna have something that only has 100 miles of range or 150 miles of range it has to be 300 when you know in reality you really don't need that depending on the use case okay so Audi e-tron sportback versus e-tron why would you get the sportback and the only thing I can think is appearance I think that's really its only big advantage I could be wrong but I think that's about it you're gonna get more cargo space uh, with the regular e-tron and actually what I was surprised to see this has a lower drag coefficient because of the shape so point which I would assume would mean it's going to have better highway range real world uh, that said it's EPA rating range for this is four miles less than the regular e-tron so I don't exactly know why that occurs um, and why the one that is more aerodynamic 0.28 CD versus 0.3 CD uh, that's strange to me but that's how it played out so you get more cargo space uh, you spend less money and you have more range if you go with the regular e-tron if you get this one subjectively you may think that it looks better so I would probably go with the regular e-tron and finally what's this thing like to drive so maybe it's because for the past two and a half years I've been regularly driving electric cars uh, to me it's not a you know revolutionary remarkable experience it feels very normal uh, except you get the benefits of an EV and I think the other good thing they have going for them is the ride quality of this vehicle I think a big part of that is how heavy it is but it has a nice air suspension very good ride quality very comfortable in here uh, it's quiet in here you get the response uh, and the torque of an electric car, which is fantastic. So I think, you know, it's a, it's a genuinely decent option. From a value perspective, I think, you know, you, you put this side by side with the Tesla Model X, the Model X has more range, it has more power, it's got all those enthusiast things. So there's certainly a value proposition to be had, um, and, and that's something you gotta consider, you know, which one do you like more? But overall, I, I think it's very cool that this car exists, and I think for a lot of people that are skeptical of the EV market, driving something like this would be like, oh, 
oh, actually, they're pretty cool. They're pretty normal. There's nothing bizarre about it. Uh, and so I think that's a good thing about it. Anyways, that's a description on Brake by Wire and the Audi e-tron Sportback. Thank you all so much for watching. And if you have any questions or comments, of course, feel free to leave them below.